Welcome to the Layman Seminary. We're continuing our series on a uh, book overview through descriptive summaries uh, that we're making surveys for the book. And, and my wife and I, we left off with 1 John uh, chapter three in the midpoint. And so we'll continue with that, or at least I will with y'all. She's sleeping on the other side of the world right now, but um, I need to get this finished. We'll probably end up doing 2 John together when we meet. Okay, so the last one we did was just just to have it in my. I tell you what, we need to we need to do a little bit of reviewing, just so I can remember what we've said before. Uh, spelling's not set up and all of that, but let me pray real quick for y'all, and for this study. Father God, as you come to you, Lord, um, we confess our sins for the one fellowship with you, Lord. Um, and Lord, we just pray right now that you bless this time. Uh, help us to understand your scripture. Help us to use this stuff in ministry if it's beneficial. Um, just help us be closer to you and to closer to our other brothers and sisters um, through knowing your word better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Now, I'm not sure if I said our brothers and sisters or your brothers and sisters, but if I did say that, I meant our brothers, not as in God has brothers and sisters. Let me just clarify that. I don't want people to think I'm Mormon or something or, or some variation of that. Anyway, first John description summary, the first one. John begins his letter talking about the word of life that is Jesus Christ. The apostolic circle has had a unique experience with him and therefore has unique authority. He wanted his audience to have doctrinal fellowship with the father and the son and joy, okay? 1, 5, 15. John refers to the message from the word of life that says God is light, holiness, so believers should not walk in darkness by confessing their sin so that they will be restored to spiritual fellowship. 2, 1 through 6. John addresses them as spiritual children and tells them he wants them to not sin, but when they do, Christ's provision at the cross and as their advocate covers them. Believers should obey the commands of Jesus, which is of maturity and properly walking in doctrinal and spiritual fellowship. 2, 7 through 14. John addresses three levels of spiritual maturity of perhaps different generations and says they should have love, which is walking in the light. Positional truth is interspersed. John explains that what he's saying is both new and old. It's old because it's the principle of Leviticus 19, 18, and also that Jesus taught. It's new because a new code is in place during the church age. This is an allusion to John 15. 2, 15 through 17. John tells them to not love the world's ways, but rather focus on loving God by doing his will to be blessed. 18 to 25, John explains in a warning about the Antichrist and the Antichrist that are the false apostles who do not remain in apostolic doctrine because they denied that Jesus is the Christ, which means they did not have the Father also. John wants his audience to remain in the apostolic teaching that he has given them, and this is called the promise of eternal life from the word of life, so quality of life. 226 and 27. John warns of possible deception, but mentions the ministry of the Holy Spirit to remind them that they have already been taught by him and will be led by him. This passage does not do away with human with the gift of teaching, with the human uh, humans with the gift of teaching, is probably how I would just say it. 228, 29. John tells them to remain in fellowship with Jesus so that they will not feel temporarily ashamed of the judgment seat of Christ. 3, 1 through 3. John reminds them of the Father's great love, even though we don't know what our glorified body will look like, but this hope has a purifying effect. Uh, John 3, 4 through 10, this is where we left off. John gives two purposes for Christ's work and explains that living a lifestyle sin does not reflect that they're acting like children of God because they're imitating the devil instead of God the Father by not loving. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in so we can see the scripture. Uh, this is divided up by the Greek paragraphs of the UBS uh, 5 uh, or 4. I can't remember which one we're on now. But anyway, so let me increase the font size so we can see a little bit better. For, so this is an explaining thought. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning. You have heard from the beginning is a phrase that we constantly see repeated that goes all the way back to the uh, the beginning chapter, that we are to love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And for what reason did he murder him? Because his own deeds are evil, but his brothers were righteous. Okay, so we're talking about righteousness here. 
Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of, all right, so here's a prohibition. Uh, we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brothers and sisters. Okay. Uh, this one who does not remains in death. Everyone who hates the brother and sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life remaining in him or abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we have to lay down a life for our brothers and sisters. But whoever has worldly goods sees his brother or sister in need and closes his heart against them, how does the love of God remain in him? Little children, let's not love with word or with tongue, but in deed or truth. Okay, now this is a notoriously hard passage. And the reason it's hard is because our theology a lot of times gets in the way. Um, so I'm going to attempt to try to do a, a, a tentative and preliminary descriptive summary for this whole paragraph or whatever. Um, but I know it's going to fall short. So I would say. I'm going to say John explains. It's talking about the children of God and are obvious he does not love his brother. All right. John explains this. Um, and asserts that this is the same message that was even taught from the beginning, which in this context alludes to Genesis because of the example of Cain and Abel, okay? While this passage does not address the save, uh, address positional salvation, it does refer to ethical or practical or what I call experiential righteousness of Abel. It's possible that this passage is using the example of an unbeliever for the believer, but it's also possible that both Cain and Abel were both believers. Regardless, the hate manifested in murder indicated a lack of love and intimacy. If eternal life abiding refers to quality of life or being in spiritual fellowship, then this passage says they that no one in that sin has fellowship with God. Okay, well, first John 1 9 told about confessing sin, and 2 1 also talked about how we have an advocate, so that needs to be factored in as well. Um, the purpose of this passage is to exhort Christians to love in deed and in truth. 
So doctrine and practice, you could say. Okay, that's a whole lot right there. And I, hopefully I at least alluded to the issues, the interpretive issues, uh, because you just can't go through and, and describe the passage because there's not enough information. Let me give you an example. And I have other videos of this. All right, we're to love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one. If you see this passage and you think that was of the evil one means that he was not saved, then that's going to affect how you view Cain. All right. And then it may affect your theology because you might say that, that you can't act like Cain and say you're saved. However, if you understand that this was of the evil one refers to uh, he was acting like his father, the devil, as an imitation, which the imitation and sonship concept is connected in chapter three and even in John chapter eight. And I have a video comparing John eight with uh, um, with first John three and I think even first John five. Um, so that's going to affect things. OK. It gives the reason or the has his own deeds were evil, but his brothers are righteous. And so it, it gives the motives and stuff. I could mention that if I wanted to. Um, so if you assume that Cain's an unbeliever and that this is a phrase referring to an unbeliever and you see this passage dealing with all these actions, you would basically say a Christian can't be saved and commit murder. Or a Christian can't be saved and not have love for his brothers and sisters. There's various continues that people would argue that way. I don't believe that that's what's going on here. I believe that the purpose of the book is fellowship. And so whenever he's talking about these things here, he's saying you don't have fellowship if you're acting like this, if you're thinking like this. And, uh, um, and the other difficult passage is, well, this is a difficult one right here because we have passed from death to life because um, John uses this phrase in the gospel of John. But one way to deal with that is that the Gospel of John is written for evangelistic purposes, where the first John is written for fellowship. And so they can use similar terminology, similar analogies, but he ships them according to his purpose. Another thing to factor in is that there's still discipleship material in the Gospel of John. So there may be portions of John that a lot of people typically think of about positional truth or salvation and say that it's related, uh, the, come to find out, it's actually related to fellowship concepts. And then it would have a more tighter correspondence or relationship with First John. Um, but those are some of the issues right here. So right here, it says the one who does not love remains in death, okay? So this is important because this is the one who does not love. Love is a state described here, right? The state of love, in other words, we know the fruit of the spirit or love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. One who does not love. In other words, does not show love, uh, does not express love. There's not in a state of fellowship that expresses love. That's the better way for me to say it. That person is described as remain, remaining or abiding in death. So I, let, me sh let me see if I could annotate maybe what's going on in this section. And I'm going, I'm going further, I'm going this deep. Oops, I gotta remember one my screen. I gotta do a stop screen, a new share. Okay, let me do the whiteboard here. Um, I'm going a little bit further in this because I want us to show how, even when we're doing our preliminary and tentative answers, our pre-understanding, what we know with the passage, what we understand about the book, what we understand about our theology, it's gonna get in the way. And I've dealt with this passage a lot. And so uh, whenever I made my descriptive summary, I wrote things in such a way where I showed that I was aware of those things. Um, but of course, when you would dig into the book, you know, our goal is not to prove that our descriptive summaries are correct. Our goal is, is to show how um, clausal layouts, exegetical outlining, how uh, syntax, how discourse, how all of that stuff, uh, refines and corrects our descriptive summaries. Because I, I know that if we go in and we zoom and we look at things more closely and, and that we're going to get better refinement, okay? 
So let's just talk about this in general, because we see this two sphere idea in the Bible. Okay, Let, let's just use the, one of the examples for positional truth. A lot of times in scripture, we have this idea that unbelievers are in Adam. Okay. And believers are in Christ. And we would call this positional. In other words, you've passed from death to life. You're in a new sphere, a new realm. This is your identity. Your identity is in Christ. Okay. But there are some passages of scripture that say things like uh, put off the old man. Okay. And then it'll say put on the new man or christ i think or clothe yourself with christ something something to that effect and so a lot of, you know uh some take this is that even though we are dead in adam right but now we're alive in christ positionally it's still possible to act like the old man. And, and so therefore in our experience, we can either act like the old man, live like the old man, or we can put on Christ, okay? So that's that language there. Now, John uses, uh, in John, I think it's John five, he says that we pass from death to life. Right, and this would be positional death in the gospel that you're an unbeliever and then you get saved. And the same thing here, position. But there's an issue with this because um, when John is writing, he uses light and darkness and things like that. And so right here, whenever and so context determines how he's using this metaphor. So in other words, you can be positionally in Christ, okay? But that does not mean you're experientially abiding in Christ, okay? And so that would mean that when you're not abiding, you're remaining. So the opposite of remaining in Christ is to remain in death or to what did this passage say i'm done with this i can go back to my other screen share you passed out of death to life because we know that one who uh one who does not love remains in death in other words they're acting like they're in that spirit death they're stuck even though their position has changed they're stuck um and then no one who has murder has eternal life remaining in him. Now, if this passage would have said no one has eternal life at all, it might have been a stronger argument to say, well, this person is not saved. However, even in that argument, eternal life is by itself, even with that statement, still can have the qualitative aspect. But whenever it's used in remaining, if you'll trace it throughout the book and also in relation to John 15, you see that it's talking about this remaining, abiding, continuing fellowship of dependence. So the fact that it says eternal life remaining in him clarifies some things. Because for those that think you cannot lose your salvation, then this passage could not be true. Because uh, eternal life doesn't just remain in him. It's always in him, right? Um, so... Uh, this makes it sound like that no murderer has eternal life remaining in him. Now they could say, well, that means he's not saved, but notice it says remaining or abiding or continuing in him. Now, what happens a lot of times though, is people will say that when you're taking abiding, that that means indwelling. And that's not my position. I believe that it's talking about fellowship, dependence, 
uh, even obedience, you know, those ideas related to that. But I don't think it's the, the same Paul, Pauline in Christ idea uh, or the indwelling idea here. I mean, there's other ways that that could be expressed. So you see, there's a lot of difficulties with this passage. And uh, um, my wife was bringing up in the last video, I said, you know, we already did uh, almost half the book in one hour because that, we only had one hour to study. And she's like, yeah, but, uh, and I said, I basically wrote down what you said and, and, and I was paraphrasing her, you know, but she was like, I couldn't do this on my own time. And if you're satisfied with just describing the passage, it, uh, given your initial oppressions, then you can do it. You know, I just described several different theological issues in, in, one, in one swoop. Of course, I've had a lot of practice. But if you're not trying to get into the discussion that I'm trying to get into right now, um, then you can you can make a summary. You could say some. Uh, you it, now your summary may sound more like a paraphrase than a descriptive summary because you might you might be afraid to make a guess of how to interpret uh, these phrases or these passages in your preliminary tentative uh, descriptive summary, and so that hesitation may cause you to go think go at it more slower and more carefully. Um, but but you're not unpacking anything. Your descriptive summary should be, in a way, it should be like a preliminary or tentative interpretation. You're just like, let me record my first impression of the passage. If you don't think it the first time you read it, then don't write it down. Um, that's why a lot of times I'll tell my wife or, or she'll tell the people that she teaches, okay, read the passage and then close your eyes and tell me what it's about. So because they're not looking at the passage, they're able to uh, bring to mind what, remember, and of course they're gonna miss a whole bunch, but it captures their it captures a, uh, what they remember and that helps them with their initial impression. Okay, so let me keep going. I'm gonna try to go a little bit faster through, these, through this next section. But I just want y'all to see that, that your prior study, your uh, assumptions about the text, all of those things are going to factor in and, and be reflected in your descriptive summary. And that's fine, as long as you know that it's an observational step. You're not claiming to make this perfect commentary or anything like that. You're just getting your first impression, your initial impression on paper. And this is, even though this is a synthetic method, this is not synthesis because synthesis is after you do analysis. This is just so that we can get an overview of the book uh, in a more accurate way than just um, skimming the book. I guess that's the way to say it. Even though we are skimming it, we're skimming it closer to the ground. Um, so we, we will know by this that we are of the truth, okay? And, and we'll set our hearts at ease before him. That if our hearts condemn us, that God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. Okay, so I might say something like this. In light of the strong statements concerning the sin of lack of love, I guess you could say, lack of love or hate, uh, John reminds his audience that when they feel condemned uh, or convicted possibly, but condemned is usually something more than conviction. And I'll talk about that for a moment in a minute. Uh, they feel condemned, God, is the one the believer should listen to because he knows all things, all right? When 
our heart does not condemn us. All right, so we have confidence before God. Okay, so this one is even pretty close to a, a, a paraphrase. Um, Concerns of God, especially in the area of prayer. It's the same, uh, because we, oh, I'm sorry. I, I jumped to uh, chapter five, because there's a similar statement there. Uh, before, uh, and whatever we ask, we see, oh, well, it is, it is here, especially in prayer. So he's dealing with that issue, even as we're, and, and receive from it, because we keep his, especially in prayer, due to obedience. Um, or obedience that pleases him. Yeah, this one is more like a paraphrase, but that's fine. I could always reduce it more. This is a commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just commanded us. He reminds them that Jesus' commandment was to believe. I'm going to put the right thing. I'm going to put to believe in him. In him and love one another. So this is definitely John 15, harking it back to. And the idea being is that he's saying to believe in him so the idea is since they positionally believe they should experientially believe but even in john 15 it's not on positional truth it's focusing on experiential belief so that's more of a theological statement there so um the one that keeps commandments remains in him. So this clarifies what it means to, to be in fellowship with God, to uh, not remain, what it means to, uh, let's see, where is it? Know that the murder has eternal life remaining in him. Uh, how does the love of God remain in him? So that's what this passage is emphasizing is that the way that you can show your love to God is by being obedient to God. And this is simple as the way a child can show his love to his parents is by being obedient to his parents. So you have this parental thing from the very beginning. Uh, in fact, I, maybe I should do something like that. Uh, and it says, we know by this that he remains in us. Now, we remaining in him and he remaining in us is two different relationships, okay? Um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But this is, uh, he is using remain in the sense of indwelling here, it looks like, okay? So they should experience, experientially believe the one who keeps commands made in me and him. Obedience is remaining in him in terms of fellowship uh, by the spirit him has given us but remain but him remaining in us is the indwelling of the holy spirit so there's an interplay here, interchange here by the spirit him he's given us. Um, there's, there's other options that are coming to my mind about how to understand this passage, but I'm going to go to Paul real quick. And yeah, I know Paul and John are different. However, John has the benefit of having uh, Paul's writings. So We'll just go to a, a passage that I think is similar in idea from Paul. I think it's in 12. Make this bigger.
Okay, right here. For just as the body is one as many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many are one body, so is also Christ. For by one spirit we were baptized into one body. All right, so that's the spirit, right? Now look right here. And whether it's slave or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Some take the first part, baptism, as, as a positional ministry, baptism of the Holy Spirit, which I, I agree. And then the drinking of the spirit would refer to the indwelling because it's uh, made to drink. Um, but it could it could possibly even have an experiential idea because you don't stop drinking of the spirit. Um, so that's those are possibilities. Um, but I'll just keep this for uh, as it is right now. All right, so four, one through six. Beloved, so here he's affectionately, you know, indicating tone. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits see whether they're from God. And then he gives a reason, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So the spirits that he's talking about are related to the false prophets. Uh, the, it could be the spirit of the false prophets. By this, you know the spirit of God. Because earlier he's talking about the spirit right here, right? In the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come to flesh from God. So this is the true doctrine. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. So he talked about the Antichrist earlier. So he's specifying this specific false teaching, which you have heard is coming and now is already in the world. You are from God. Okay, this is source idea. Little children have overcome them. Okay. Is this positional overcoming? Because greater is he who is in you than is in the world. It seems to indicate that right there. He that is in you is positional and dwelling. Um, and they are from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world. And, and, the, and the world listens to them. We are from God. The one who knows God listens to us. Okay, That doesn't mean every believer you encounter is going to listen to you or agree with you but i think what this is saying is that uh the us would be the apostolic circle the one who is not from god does not listen to us by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error and so this could be a good uh passage to sh show that the uh those that departed from the apostolic circle were not believers however being from god it can refer to origin or source or dependence ideas related to that. So um, that's just something to explore at a later point. But John affectionately, uh, warns them about the source and the content of the false prophets and he gives them a test concerning doctrine that probably weeds out the Serinthius and the uh, docetus, can't spell that right right now. But uh, these are Gnostic beliefs uh, that basically denied that Jesus Christ was in the flesh. Serenthius, I think, taught that the Holy Spirit had came upon Jesus, uh, almost like an adoptionism idea. And docetus is the idea that because matter is evil and, and God is good, then there's, and if Jesus is God, then there's no way that that uh, he could have took on human flesh, but it appeared or made the scene that way. Um, it weeds out the parenthesis, okay? Um, as those who reject apostolic doctrine. Um, Okay, going on.
when my wife sees this video, she goes, like, see, I told you that you could not take 12 hours, uh, 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 an hour to do. And like, yeah, but I'm, I could do it if I was doing it myself. But if I'm explaining to others uh, why I'm making the decisions I'm making, then yeah, I can't do it in an hour. So again, beloved, again, let's love one another for love is from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God, okay? The one who does not love God does not know God because God is love. By this, the love of God was revealed in us that God was sent his only son of the world so they may live through him. So this is talking about how love is revealed in the son. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us to send his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us. See, this is the idea of the remaining idea that we're talking about here. And his love is perfected in us. God remains in fellowship with us. All right, so I'm going to say continuing the tone of affection. He exhorts them to love one another, to show that they have fellowship with God. Um, that is possible because of the cross provision and propitiation that ties back to the basis for advocacy of Jesus Christ that's in two. Um, All right. I went kind of fast at that time, but based on what I've told you on the video, I think you all can get where, where I got what I got. All right. By this, we know that we remain in him and he in us because he's given to us his spirit. Now, if we go back to the beginning of the book, okay, this is why I don't kind of think this is positional. Yeah, he says... Um, Where, where do I want to see it? Um, in the very beginning, he's explaining that, uh, okay, so that you too may have fellowship with us, the apostles. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So that makes me believe that the passages that even talk about remaining or abiding, that they're still talking about fellowship, even concerning the Father. So when we come to, I mean, Let's go back to where we were. By this, we know that we remain in fellowship with him and he in fellowship with us. It's because he's given us his spirit, right? Um, now, the, an interesting idea, and I've never thought about this idea, but when it's talking about his spirit, earlier it talked about you received an anointing and all of this. This may be, even though it's referring to the spirit, it may be referring to the spiritual gifts. And so the idea is, is that we know that we're in fellowship with him, doctrinal fellowship with him, because he's made us apostles, you know. That, that could be an idea. I've never considered that before, but I'm thinking about it. Anyway, um, we have seen and testified that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world who have confessed Jesus, Son of God, God remains in him, he and God. So this is, a, I still think this is all about doctrinal fellowship. And, and of course, if you deny doctrine, you don't have spiritual fellowship as well. We come and know and believe the love of God for us. God is love and the one remains in love remains in God and God remains in him. And this is important because God is not love, right? But this says, if you remain in love, you remain in God. 
But what this means is remains in fellowship because that's the only way God's love can manifest. All right, so um, John continues to explain that the proof of, I'm gonna put it this way, the proof of spiritual fellowship with God is is first related to doctrinal fellowship with God. Now, a person can have right doctrine and not be in spiritual fellowship with God. Uh, but he's trying to weed out the false teachers. And I think, I think uh, uh, Paul did something very similar in 1 Corinthians 12 where he's talking about the spirit. And he says right here, he mentions about their previous life uh, as unbelievers, you know, how they were caught up in ecstatic utterances and all of that stuff. That stuff was existing before they ever had uh, the, the, the spiritual gifts, okay? Um, but it was counterfeit, of course. And therefore, he says, therefore, I make known to you that the one speaking by the spirit of God says Jesus is a curse. No, and so in other words, no one can say Jesus is cursed by the spirit of God. Or Jesus cannot. I'm sorry. Let me clarify that. The one that uh, that no one speaking by the spirit of God. In other words, it's some other spirit either themselves or demonic activity says Jesus is a curse. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's saying there's no reason you should listen to someone claiming to have this spiritual gift or operating in this spiritual gift if their doctrine is not correct. And this goes all the way back to Deuteronomy uh, concerning the test of prophets and all of that. It just extends to the other uh, gifts as well. Um, so it's first related to doctrine of fellowship with God. He wants them to be able to see, look, these people are not in the doctrine of fellowship, so they don't have spiritual fellowship, so don't even listen to them. And that type of thing is really what's going on here. All right. By this, love is perfected with us. And this means mature or complete, made whole, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, we are in the world, okay? There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, he hates his brother and sister, he's a liar, which goes back to earlier what he said about a liar. He says it walks in fellowship. But the one who does not love his brother and sister whom he's seen cannot love God whom he's not seen. And this commandment we have from him, the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. Well, what I'm kind of thinking here is that these people that, that false apostles, whatever you want to call them or whatever, they stirred people up and they, they it seems to be that there's pride involved where it, it's led to hate, you know, a lack of love. And so he's just pointing out, look, they're not operating by the spirit. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody that comes to you, you know, and acting all moral and everything, that they're of God. But he's bringing, he's saying, look, look at how us apostles carry ourselves and look how they're carrying themselves. Their doctrine is wrong. Their character is wrong. Okay. The worst false prophet or teacher you got to look for or will look out for is one that has all false words. But he, he lives right. He, he looks good outwardly. Anyway. Um, so John continues to talk. Because he used perfected earlier, but I didn't touch on it. Continues to talk about maturity. And how positionally overcoming gives the believer confidence, okay, that as they work on being in fellowship 
with God, they will have. Uh, I'm going to put this, it's not the perfect words, but I'll just put it in my mind. A good experience at the have, let, let's put it this way the best experience for them at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm not happy with that statement, but that's what's coming out. So that's what I'll put. Um, um, let's see here. It is a reminder that a lack of love makes a person a liar who claims to love. Also love his brother and sister. Okay. Not really happy with that statement, but I'm just trying to get my initial impressions going. All right, everyone who believes that Jesus is Christ has been born of God. Now, I did next talk about born of God earlier as well. Um, the one who has correct doctrinal views about Jesus indicates that he is in doctrinal fellowship, which involves sonship imitation, not imitation, I'll explain that statement in a minute. Because born of God, this doesn't necessarily have to be positional because this could be meaning parented by God. And it's the idea of living by example. Everyone whose father loves the, ch uh, the child born of God. Well, sonship imitation. So they should love everyone in the family. But loving God means obeying God. And when it's talking, let me say this, when he's talking about commandments, context determines what commandments are in view. This is not referring to 613 commandments if you want to make that type of division. It's not referring to Sabbath keeping and all of that. It's referring to the context uh, determining what code is in operation. Um, it means obeying God. All right, for who has been born of God overcomes the world all right so this if born of god is not positional then this overcoming the world is is uh experiential but loving god means obeying god and experientially overcoming now that could refer to positionally overcoming but that's an issue a person needs to work out. This is the victory that has overcome our world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the son of God? Okay. By correct doctrine about Jesus. Now, that's not exhausting the saying you have to know every single thing, but as far as the doctrines that were expected for them to know at this time, all right, I have videos, I have a whole playlist on First John, so those are going to be more accurate, and one thing I will do in the future is I'll take those and I'll integrate it with this work here, but I have to get this assignment done. So this is the one that came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but water with blood, the spirit of testifying, the spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. If we receive the testimony of people, the testimony of God is greater. The testimony of God is this, that he testified the Son of the Son. 
The one who believed in the Son of God is testimony himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he does not believe the testimony that God has given concerning the Son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and his life is in the Son. The one who has the Son has the life. The one who does not have the Son does not have life. Okay. So a lot of this, John, and he does this in the Gospel of John as well. John argues for the greatest testimony of the son is the father and the miraculous things that occurred at the cross and, and other times, I guess you could say. Um, the greatest just one the son is the father like the same that occurred at the cross. And to deny the doctrines about the son means one does not have the father also. Now that may actually be in the next paragraph. Uh, let's see. So yeah, that's the next paragraph. Of the sun means one does not have eternal life. And I'm gonna put as in quality, but it could be saying they're not saved. I'm not denying that. Um, but I think whenever you factor in everything the book's saying and how eternal life is being used, that may weight things in a particular way. Um, all right, so next, little bitty paragraph here. These things are written to you when you the name of the Son of God so they may know that you have eternal life. John writes for assurance so that they may know they have fellowship with God. Uh, and taking eternal life in that sense is it says uh, Deuteronomy 30. So they have fellowship with God. Um, I'm going to say related to eternal life. Um, he mentions prayer, confidence, again. Because he's already touched on it before. All right. 16. He qualifies this prayer confidence <clears throat> with the recognition that some people are not to be prayed for at that time. And I say at that time because we don't have apostles walking the earth now. And so that may be a factor in this. And this deals with divine discipline. So this deals with divine discipline, sin unto death, which I think is related to the book of Numbers and other passages like that. But that's just to trigger my mind to talk about those things. Um, this probably refers to the ones who refuse to come back into doctrinal fellowship. So the false apostles are influenced people and some people are, are no longer holding the correct doctrines about Jesus. So he's giving them a warning. Um,
we know that no one's been born of God's sins. And then I'm not going to take this as habitually, but I think John clarifies that when a person sins, it is not an expression of being parented, uh, oh, let me put it this way, of imitating God as perfect parent. Okay. Um, who's born of God keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. Imitating God is a perfect parent. No one has been born of God since, but he who is born of God keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. Uh, a specific, a specific sin may be in view, uh, but God's provision of protection is also in view. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Notice the word power is in italics. So lies in or lies of the evil one. So, um, and we know the son of God has come and given us our sense when we know him is true. And we are in him is true. His son, Jesus Christ, true God, eternal life. Protection of God. In contrast to the world being of the evil one, you know, the word sourced or animated by the world of the evil one, the believer is sourced by God because Jesus is the true God in contrast to false views of Christ, which are idolatry. All right. Little children, guard yourself from idols. So, all right, we got it all. So now what we got to do, we got to copy it. And then we're going to paste it. Then what we're going to do is we're going to remove the verses, get everything all in one place. So if you saw my video on uh, Second Peter, where I did everything in one sitting, you'll know what I'm fixing to do next. And uh, basically, we're going to try to take these paragraphs and we're going to try to divide them up into sections. Um, since I've already read the, how the first part of the book goes, I will only read uh, from the second part. But I do want to be I do want to be um, highlighting repeated themes and, and ideas like that. So I may, um, if y'all will put up with me, I may read it all together again. And once again, I repeat the idea that there's no way that I think that my descriptive that are tentative and preliminary are fully accurate. I'm not claiming that, okay? So let's bring this down to normal size 100% and let's uh, just turn this back to 12 point font so we can see what we're really dealing with here. And I'll, I'll zoom back in as we're discussing things. Look. Okay. Now. So really, 
we've we've made a descriptive summary for the entire book at the paragraph level, and it only took up two pages, which is, is pretty good. Okay. All right. So let's see if we can notice shifts in tone here based on content um, by looking at these descriptive summaries. John begins his letter talking about the word of life that is Jesus Christ. The apostolic circle has had a unique experience with him and therefore has unique authority. He wants his audience to have doctrinal fellowship with the Father, the Son, and joy. Right, and I'm, I'm going to put the fruit of joy. John refers to the message from the word of life. Okay, so we got word of life here. We got word of life here that says God is light. So believers should not walk in darkness by confessing their sin so that they will be restored to spiritual fellowship. So we have doctrinal fellowship here. And we got spiritual fellowship here. Okay. John addresses them as spiritual children and tells them, so spiritual children and spiritual fellowship and tells them he wants them to not sin. Okay, so not sin is, uh, we saw sin mentioned up here by confessing their sins, okay? But when they do, Christ's provision at the cross, an advocate covers them. Um, the blood of, this passage talks about the blood of Christ cleansing from sin. I'm just going to put that here. Just to remind me, because I didn't include that in, in my summary. And uh, so, go with red, since talking about the blood. All right. Christ's provision at the cross, an advocate covers them. I think that's very much the same idea. Believers should obey the commands of Jesus, which is maturity and proper walk in a doctrinal and spiritual fellowship. So you have doctrinal and spiritual fellowship, again, being emphasized here. Okay. Um, what I'm seeing so far is he's introducing doctrinal fellowship, but then he's including the issue of sin here. Okay. And we also see that he's talking about children again when he talks about different levels of spiritual maturity, perhaps different generations. So they should have love, which is walking in the light. Well, walking in the light was also mentioned. We'll make it yellow since it's light. Um, walking in darkness, okay? And walking in very similar ideas. Positional truth is in its birth. John explains that what he is saying is both old and new. Okay. Um, the old and new kind of ties back to what was from the beginning idea. Um, but I don't know if I want to do anything with that right now. Well, then again, no, because he mentions obeying commands. So let's make obeying command this color here. And then uh, both old and new. And so that's all talking about that. It's new because new code and church age. This is an allusion to John 15. John tells him to not love the world's ways, but rather focus on loving God by doing his will to be blessed. Okay, so this idea of love. I don't think love was initially mentioned. We'll make love purple. Um, So one division, one division of uh, um, First John that I'm aware of in previous studies is a distinction between God is light, which relates to holiness of revealing himself, and love. And uh, it is interesting that you don't see love mentioned in these concepts, even though the idea may be there, but we'll see about that. Rather focus on loving God by doing his will to be blessed. John explains as a warning about the antichrist and the antichrist that are false apostles so um you have the apostolic circle right here which are the true apostles let's make it blue and then 
we'll just make this blue because even though it's the opposite of it, it's related idea. Um, because they did, and they don't remain in the apostolic doctrine, which relates to doctrinal fellowship. They denied that Jesus is Christ, which means they don't have the Father also. And I don't know if that passage actually said that or if I was reading forward. So I'll underline that. John wants his audience to remain in the apostolic teaching it's given them, and this is called the promise of eternal life from the word of life, so quality of life. So if this is the idea that maybe eternal life is being first mentioned here. Um, let's use gray. John warns of possible deception, but mentions the ministry of the Holy Spirit to remind them that they have already been taught by him. Possible deception, this is clearly still warning about the Antichrist. So we'll make it blue. Oh, I made it. Okay. Remind them they have already been taught by him, led by him. Passage does not do away with human and the gift of teaching. John tells them to remain in fellowship with Jesus so they will not feel temporarily ashamed of the judgment of Christ. Oh, this is going to be a hard book to divide up. I, I feel like I need to start making divisions early on, though. Okay, so let's just say um, one, one, four is the introduction. To the goal of, well, let me just say introduction to <clears throat> how about this introduction of apostolic authority and doctrinal fellowship as the goal. All right, and then um, we'll call this a hindrance. Um, he uses the word, let's go back to uh, First John and look at this, look at the text on this. My little children. I'm assuming that every time he uses the little children, he's he's kind of uh, indicating a new section. So let's do that. Let's go through and uh, mark every time he uses children, and this will help us have a structural basis for our divisions. And we can do this in the Greek, but we're just going to do it in English for now. So I'm going to put children. All right, so every time children shows up, I'm going to indicate it. I'm writing to you little children. So there's a, all right. I've written to you children. But see, this is in that section where he's talking about different levels of spiritual. Okay, children, it is the last hour. Now little children remain in him. Children of God love one another, okay. Now the children of God ideas here, even though they're not being addressed. Um, children of God again, little children. Again. Again, the description of the children of God. And chip a little. All right, so little children is more accurate than children. Uh, that's what I'm seeing. So let's make a note of everywhere little children occurs. We'll do that in a second. I'm just highlighting them all right now. And then you have the children of God. Um, and little children. Now, is he, when he's talking about little children, is he addressing one little group? within there um i don't know but all right so backing up so if we say my little children
Je veux que ça se passe. Our doctor fellowship has to go. Uh, I don't like doing this because it just feels contrived if I do this. But um, I'm going to go ahead and lump five through ten together. So one through ten. Introduction of apostolic authority and doctor fellowship is a go. As well. as spiritual fellowship that is hindered by sin that has been provided for. Not my, that, that needs a whole lot of work, but that would mean that I'm viewing that as one whole unit. And I'll make this purple so that we can see that that's a major summary. All right, so going with this, my little children, so in 2-1, the first statement of 2-1, uh, let's just, little children, and let's make it bigger so that we can see it, little children division, and we'll find the next one. 212. Okay, that one's going to be interspersed within this section here. So I'll put it here, but to me, it's not a very significant, uh, I don't think it's dividing. Maybe as a subsection, but not as a main section. Uh, 28. Is that 28? Yeah, 28. Okay, so then this would be little children to 28. So, all right, keep going. Three, seven. That would be inside of here as well. Now, probably the beloveds actually are better divisions. 318. Four, four. So what I'm noticing is, is that the um, it's not hitting smack dab in the middle of the uh, the paragraph divisions, and then the last words twenty one. I mean, I I feel like there's a division there, but I don't know how to describe it yet. So I'm just gonna wait. And I'm going to go in and children of God does not seem to be primary. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a common repeated motif or theme, but let's do the beloved. Because that's used in other books as well. Um, across the Bible as indicators of new divisions. So let's use beloved. Um, First John 2, 7, we have a beloved. So let's put our beloved right here. And that does begin that section. So that could have more weight. Um, 3, 2. That's close to beginning the section. Oops, I should have copied beloved. Three, two. Three, twenty-one. I'll go ahead and throw it up here. I did it again. <laughs> beloved, three, twenty-one.
four one. Four seven. Beloved clearly um, is more accurately at the beginning of paragraphs. First uh, John four eleven. Okay, there's a there's a four eleven going on here. All right, so we have that. Now, the other thing that we see is the word right. And I'm gonna spell it that way, W-R-I-T, without the full statement so that we can get all the statements of where he's claiming or why he wrote, all right? So 1 John 1, 4, right. All right, I'll go ahead and include it right here. One, four, right. Two, one, right. So you got the little children and the right idea right here. I'm not writing, so that's a clarification. You have it with the beloved. And what verse is that? Seven, okay. Uh, on the other hand, I am writing, so there's two eight again. I'm not, I'm seeing that as a cluster, so I'm not gonna put that. All right, so 212. I don't remember where I included that one, but I'll have to put 212 also there. There's a cluster of the writing idea um, as he's addressing different groups. I'm writing to you, young men. And I actually have a video where it talks about the purpose statements of the book. Um, children, yeah. Um, I have not written to you because you did not know the truth. Um, 121. I, I guess 220, let's see. Yeah, 221, we might include it. I just don't think it's very significant there. Uh, First John 226, these things I have written. Um, Yeah, 226. That seems to be more significant. The statement I have written. Um, uh, 513. Uh, I'm not writing to you, Nicholas. That's in another book. Okay. So if we go with the I have written, then you would have 513, 226. So let's see how that's different um, from four. These things we write. So is there another we write in, in the book? No. For we write nothing, okay, wrong book. <laughs> All right. It's trying to get back to first, John. So I'm not sure how helpful that was. I mean, I know it's helpful. Um, but are we going to be able to make hard and fast divisions based off of that? I don't think so. Um,
um, John gives his purpose for writing. We will include that one four. Okay. John explicitly addresses his audience. Hmm. So if I'm saying one through 10 is one unit, okay? Then the two, uh, rest in the spiritual children, the three levels of maturity, um, love not the world. Okay, um, addresses his audience. I, what I'm seeing is this, is that John is going to be addressing the children. Uh, um, even though there may be a, a subcategory in that, let's just go with that. John, so that means that we're gonna, we're gonna assume that the next major division is 111 all the way until five. Because the last thing it says is little children keep yourself from idols. So 521. So 521. Now that could be a summary statement. I'm just gonna say John addresses his audience as spiritual children for the most part. Addresses his audience as spiritual children. Okay. So now I gotta come up with subdivisions for that. I'm assuming that these are the major divisions. So I'm gonna think about subdivisions. Um, okay, this is different levels of maturity. I mean, I, I, I could, I could make an argument that there's different levels of maturity. That's fine. I can do that. Um, so let's say two, one through 14, there are different levels of maturity in you. Now, some people say, no, it's just referring in general and it's being poetic, but I'm leaning more to the idea that there's different levels of maturity. Paul did different levels of maturity, so why not John? Um, of course, he does it a little bit differently. So, all right, so then 15, John tells him to not love the world, the way focus, all right? And he's warning about the world, but the reason being because he's tying it to the Antichrist, and um, he does talk about the flesh. So I guess we could say John warns about the three enemies. John warns about three enemies. Now that is a larger section too. If we're going to assume that that, that section is really... Um, Um, let's see. Um, John warns about the three enemies and reminds them of God's provision. So that brings us to uh, the Holy Spirit part. 227. All right. Well, that at least brings us into. Uh, I'm going to change the color of this because I have too much purple going on here. Let's go with blue. All right, so that brings us to three at least, or 
little children in 28. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to make the argument that based on the clustering of 28 and 32 um, that the division should begin at 228. So let's try that. 228 till So he's warning them about being ashamed of the judgment seat of Christ. He's talking about the, um, we don't know what will be. So that's definitely related to the um, judgment seat of Christ. He gives us the, 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 the destruction, you know, the two things that, that Jesus Christ did um, or the results that should occur. Um, all right. So 228. Um, I'm going to put something like live in light of future judgment, but have a mature outlook on it. And I'll explain that in a minute. That's something that, that, um, Let's see, live in light of future judgment. I would actually say live in light of temporal and future judgment. That deals with divine discipline and have a mature outlook on it. So what, where would I keep going in the Senate to death ideas? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and treat that as a main division, which will be a subdivision actually, five. 21, so 228, 521, it's a main subdivision. Once I put the chart up there in a minute, we'll, we'll clarify this. So um, that means I'm gonna have divisions underneath that. Um, so 228, 228 till um, 310 is, uh, um, think about the future. Think about the far future, if you will, or the imminent future, something like that, 310. Um, think about the future and the past. So what I mean by that is it's talking about the past provisions. But actually, it's all about thinking about the future because of what God's goal. Think about the future reality, something like that. All right, 310. Okay. Um, so we're going to just keep going with the think about idea and make it 311. Think about the past. From Genesis even. From Genesis and Jesus. Think about, uh, in other words, these comments about, you know, the great, uh, not great mission, the abiding in divine language. So 311 to, uh, He's going back to false prophets. Okay. Think about from Genesis to Jesus and, and, and say love and obedience. When there, where do I want to end that? Okay, so he gives a command here to test with the strong beloved in 319. So uh, I hate to do this. I, I don't want to divide it. I want to go at a higher level. So let's take these beloveds and bring them together. This is even the beloved. It seems to be that the beloveds are not indicating major sections. They're indicating subsections, uh, 
perhaps at the paragraph level. So now I will mention that some people think, uh, well, many people think that first John is very hard to outline, that it's more like a spiral argument. Um, my wife is laughing right now how long this video is taking. You. Anyway, um, let's see, what do I want to do next? I'm going to go ahead and take three to 24. This is why some people make chapter summaries. And you can consider chapter summaries, but they're not as accurate. Um, and then we'll make we'll make a four six a new unit four one. Um, I don't like the word spiritually discern uh, because it's not the same thing as having the gift of discernment. But this is really talking about spiritually discernment. Spiritually discerning. Sorry. Are distinguishing um, spiritually discerning doctrine and fruit of the spirit idea there. Um, that goes all the way. I'm going to go to 12, all the way to 512. And then 513, uh, um, on the topic of proper prayer no this is not this is not a good summary i know that but i'm just throwing it out there um concerning enemies because even though they're brothers they're acting like enemies so let's just go with that and then um keeping yourself for idols I'm just going to say this is 220 because I got so many things that fall on 221. Okay. Now, to preserve this work that I just did, I'm going to copy it again, put it in there, and then I'm going to erase the. the Every, oh, I'm going to erase everything that's not blue. I'm going too slow here, guys. That's the other work. All right. And I'm going to shrink this down. I'm not size 10, sorry. So according to this, let's, let's make a little outline before we make our chart. Just some major divisions here. So one through 10 is one major division. And then one through 11, five through 21. Okay. For the sake of having a three-part division, an introduction, a, uh, a body and conclusion, I'm gonna make the, the third point, 521, its own division. Um, so 
521 conclusion. Now it could have two divisions, but let's just try that. All right, so then my first sub point according to this will be two, one through 14, and then 15 through, sorry. Fifteen to twenty-seven. Ah, I'm already messing up because this one through ten it seems to go underneath. All right, and we got some more here. Now I got so many spelling errors on this that I'm going to run Grammarly in a second. Okay, so. The way I have this right now, I'm going to switch that to 520. So that means that I'm seeing this is a, a, a sub points underneath here. All right, so I'm fixing to run Grammarly. I think some people have already seen me do that before. Um, and I'm gonna pretty much agree with every decision that Grammarly suggests. And then once I run Grammarly, I'm gonna run uh, word wrap. Yeah, word rate, sorry. I always miss say that one. And then I'll go from there. So my major division, three main divi major divisions. Uh, the second major divisions has three subdivisions. And one of those subdivisions has uh, four divisions in itself. So let's see how we go. So you can go get a drink, drink, uh, uh, use the restroom or whatever you need to do uh, and let it keep playing or you can skip uh, past the Grammarly part, but I'm going to run Grammarly real quick. All right. I don't care about the wordy part. I just want the spelling because when I work, run word rake, it will fix all that. And it's, I can fix if I need to lowercase or uppercase something later on. Okay, now I got 400 and something mistakes and I mean issues. So let me, let me think about what I could do here. This one preserves the scripture. Which I can always insert later on. So just for the sake of, of uh, uh, it not reading the uh, scripture as a mistake, I'm going to eliminate those scriptures for now. Not saying I'm eliminating the scripture, guys. All right. This and this section right here, it's not as colorful as the one that I have before it. So I may actually even erase uh, these since I have this preserved above. But let's let me look at it. Okay, so we got a little bit of color here. Okay. I think one thing I need to do is I need to make all the fonts uh, 12 point. So. Let's do that. And I'll just zoom in for y'all. All 
phrasing. My phrasing. So let's look at this one. See, this one has more of the colors and stuff, but it has all the black. So that means this right here, I can delete. So that's less corrections that have to be made. And then let's look at the one above it. Because it may be possible to even delete this one. Nope, because that's it. Everything else is... Uh... All right, now I can run Grammarly. And it'll be a lot faster now because we only got 156 issues. And the reason I'm doing the uh, Grammarly now is because whenever I run word rate, I want it to condense things, smooth things out. And uh, in order to do that, I had to make sure I got real words out, out here that make sense to word rate so that it'll be able to uh, read it. Okay, do you want to transition phrase? I still have it set for academic papers. So a lot of the conventions that I would normally use in regular speech, if this is my own project that I want to turn it in, that they're not gonna fly. That word false, they're not even picking up on. I spelled it so bad. <laughs> F A L S C. Duplicate pronouns. They don't. So one benefit of having the paid version of Zoom is they're not gonna cut you off after 40 minutes or whatever. Um, so I'm just thinking about that as I was doing this. I'm probably in a... a future version of these or the, the Grammarly section may be cut out. I, I don't know. I may keep it in one just for demonstrative purposes, but it will be a short video instead of a long one. But I want people to see how long my process actually takes in the stuff that I actually do. Now keep in mind, uh, if you're a great typer, you're not going to have all these mistakes, you know. Um, I don't worry about mistakes. I'm just trying to get my thoughts on paper as fast as possible. So if I, I would, and I do suggest that if a person is too slow at this, they don't worry about their mistakes. They can always go back and fix their spelling and all that stuff later on. Because you want to get your thoughts on paper and not be trying to edit yourself. There's plenty of time for that later on. Oh my 
getting closer to the end. Uh, I'm thinking though that for an outline purpose, these descriptive summaries are probably too long. And so I'll probably make a, a, a shorter version of them. In other words, condense them more, summarize it more. They don't know who Serenthius is, even if I spelled it right, but I didn't. <laughs> it's fine. I can insert that later on. I remember they got confused on that. It would be cool if Grammarly recognized, okay, this is verbatim repeated phrase. So let me just make the same changes that I make in that other section. Um, then I wouldn't have had to uh, edit uh, and delete the other part. But I got everything I want. Uh, don't really care about uh, antecedents right now. I'm clear antecedents, not for this assignment. If I was writing a paper, of course. All right, so 17 pages, eh? Is that right? I don't know how that could be right, but okay. 17 pages as it is standing right now. It's because these gaps. All right. I'll put this on a separate line. So now I'm going to run Word Rake. And hopefully, y'all are watching it because I do highly recommend this program. As you can see, look what he's doing to it. And that's it. They give me 25 suggestions and I'm going to accept them all. And if something is like totally not understandable at a later point, then we can go in and fix it. Whoa, this is in here. All right, so now I'll run Grammarly again. And it will pick up on a few things. They, they feel like the also is not needed. To be is not needed. 
preposition at the uh, end of the sentence. They don't like. All right, then I'll run word right again. Probably nothing will come up, but just in case. Yep, there is something that could come up. All right, so now we go to the review and we run the editor. And the editor is going to catch things. Corinthius? No, it's Serentius. So ignore once. Dosites, ignore once. I'll fix those myself. Thank you, guys. Got a grammar issue of John T. Got a conciseness issue. Okay. Looks good there. So now I'll run word rate again. Let me see if it picks up on anything in light of those changes. Nope. Okay, then I'll run Grammarly again. No issues found. All right, so now I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, move to. Uh, I guess I'm going to make a summary of the book from this right here. It's not going to be perfect, but it'll just give us something in here. After John introduces his epistle by establishing apostolic authority, and stating that his goal is doctrinal fellowship and for his audience to have, well, enjoy, because it could be, there's a texture variant here, so in the spiritual of joy. All right. Um, that is he also states that sin hinders spiritual fellowship, but God has made provision for that in Christ, okay? He addresses his audience as spiritual children that are at different levels of maturity but still need to be warned about the three enemies uh, three enemies as they live in light of temporal and future judgment okay they need to have a mature outlook as they think about the future reality uh in the continuity from Genesis and Jesus, 
concerning the principles of love and obedience. They are to spiritually discern doctrinal claims as well as maturity claims. Spiritual, in other words, they need to know how to pray properly even when believing that enemies. The conclusion is to avoid false views of Christ, which are idolatry. All right, so now I want to clean this up. So I'm just going to run Grammarly on that section. You think that's a monotonous passage? That's fine. So I'm going to make a summary of it. Let me run word rake. And it will just rake that section there, which is condensing it even more. All right. So based on the these brief summaries that I have above, uh, I can get an idea of what the whole book's about this idea of if I were to condense it even more, I would clearly go with this idea of doctrinal fellowship, spiritual fellowship, uh, God's provision, uh, spiritual children at different maturity levels, warned about the three enemies, live in light of temporal and teacher judgment, uh, continuity of Genesis, principles of obedience, secondary discern doctrine of claims, uh, discern spiritual maturity. Why they need to know how to pray correctly when the uh, enemies and then this. So you see, I'm just highlighting things, but this needs to be tightened up a whole lot more. So let's do this. We got one sentence there. We got one sentence here. We got one sentence here. And we got one sentence here. One sentence here. So John and Shoes is pissed by establishing. Uh, I don't need the word introduces. So John establishes. I'm, I'm going to use a different word. John distinguishes. Apostolic authority concerning doctrinal fellowship and joy that can be hindered because of sin that God has made provision for in Christ. Okay, so that summarizes that a little bit more, um, those two sentences. 
um, even though they are at different spiritual levels, they have the same enemies, vision, uh, and principles to live by such as showing of an obedience to God um, in light of temporal and Kind of weird i'm saying temporal but future judgment but future judgment or future let's do this yeah future judgment um so they should discern doctrinal claims and maturity, or let's use the word spirituality claims, and spirituality claims as they pray about things to avoid the the false doctrines about Christ, which are idolatry. Or maybe they're worshiping, the, and maybe it's not so much about the doctrines of Christ. Maybe it's because they're looking up to the false teachers so much. All right, so we've condensed it a little bit more. So let's run uh, Grammarly. Um, made a lot of mistakes in that little bit of sense. <laughs> well, not sense, um, section. All right. So now we've got one sentence. We got two sentences and we got three. Challenge is to get it down to one sentence, guys. So uh, I would say something like this: John, John's not so. Um, I would say this: doctrinal fellowship is a prerequisite for spiritual fellowship, but both are hindered by, uh, let's do this, by the Christian's three enemies, because the flesh relates to the sin, by the Christian's three enemies, three enemies yet God has made provision in his son and for divine discipline uh so they should avoid idolatry. Now, these are pretty good summaries here, so I'm going to try to preserve them. But let's see if I can run Grammarly on it. Prerequisite by Christians. Yeah. 
Christian. Now they want me to reword it. That's fine with me. The sun, we go with that. So, idolatry. And the end. So, they're telling me that's one sentence. All right. Well, let's run word rate and see if we can simplify this one sentence. And there's no suggestions. Okay. So, let me see if there's suggestions with this. If I word rate this. All right. Let's do that. Doctor fellowship is prerequisite for spiritual fellowship, but the Christian's three enemies hinder both. Yet God has made provision in his son and for divine discipline, so they should avoid idolatry. Uh, that's pretty clear cut. I mean, I don't think I can narrow it down anymore. Um, so they should avoid, um, let's see, false doctrine. which is idolatry. Uh, I'm gonna let that ride as my summary sentence for the book for right now. So I will just say main sentence summary, something like that for book. And then the purpose for the book, I might say that, um, John writes first John to show the necessity of doctrinal fellowship, which comes from alignment with the apostolic circle because false apostles and false prophets and false teachers are um, claiming wrong views concerning sin in our sin in the sun and our uh, sin and have confuse the John's audience. So they need to know how. So they need assurance how to distinguish these enemies and also maintain fellowship, joy with each other. That's still pretty, uh, I don't like that purpose statement, but I'll work with it for right now. Um, I'll go ahead and run Grammarly on it. All right, so I'm gonna write purpose of book. All right, so that deals with the purpose of the book. Okay, so now I'm gonna make an overview chart. 
and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna complete out my outline. So let me just. Okay, so I need three main divisions. So I get go get my table, insert table one, two, three, three main divisions. Okay. And we're just gonna say one one to one ten introduction. And we're gonna say uh, uh, spiritual children. I'm, I'm going to say, um, I'm just going to call it 111 to 520. It's not 21. 20 is uh, spiritual children. All right, and then one, I mean, 521 conclusion is about idolatry. Now, if I kept it like that, as you see, I don't have very much room. So what we're actually gonna do is we're gonna take this, take that, right? And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna take it and we're gonna do text direction we're gonna make it like that. We're gonna drag this out like that so that we have that in line. I don't think it needs to be on double space, but I can fix that later. Text direction. All right. So that gives us that. And then this section here is gonna have its own divisions. Now I might've just did something wrong here. Um, yeah, I did. Okay, no problem. Insert row above. Then I collapse this merge cells. And then I will insert three division split cells into three. I got it. This can go all the way over here. And this one can go all the way over here. And then this goes in here. Whoa, I turned the right way. Where are you? Okay, and we can center this. Okay. And we can actually merge these. Boom. Merge the cells. All right. So now we look at our section here. We got one, two, three, three subdivisions. So we can do three subdivisions in here. So split the cells into three ways. Okay. And so we're going to say, uh, Make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so three ways would be uh, different levels of maturity. I'm just going to put maturity levels, and then two, one through fourteen. Okay. And then three enemies. Three enemies and uh, where is it? Two five, two fifteen through twenty seven. Three enemies and God's provision. All right. And then this one is going to be two twenty eight to 520 live in light of temporal and future judgment okay um 
the way it's set up right here, I don't have much room for that. And as you see, I got four different divisions right here. So I'm also going to shift and change the, um, the level, I'm sorry, the direction of the text here. That allows me to then set down to there. Same thing with this one. And then I think as long as I do my colors right, um, I won't have a problem. So let me just show you what I mean by that. All right, so we got one color we'll do. Let's go with this dark color. Introduction, spiritual children is that, right? Then I, if I make all these the same color, I think I won't have the problem. But I'm going to have to make divisions underneath this. And so I'm thinking I'm going to have to actually insert a row below. Take this here, stick this down here. Let me just get it all on one line and then bring it. And there's probably tons of more effective ways to do this and you all can figure that out. Um, but this is how I know how to do it. Okay. So if I can, so this, these can be merged, not a problem there. And this one could be merged. All right. Now I'm basically saying that these three sections here are the same color. So let me um, go to a lighter color to indicate that. And these actually can be merged. So merge that and merge this one. Got to go back to a lighter color so we can see that it's the divisions here. And this is still that lighter color there, All right? Now that I have that, I can make more divisions here and I can make four. One, two, three, four, four main divisions. So let's split the cell. So one, two, three, four. Okay. And then with, uh, think about the future reality. Future reality or future hope, you could say. Um, 228, 310. Now, I want to say this, and I don't believe my outline or my chart is um, indicating structural uh, major divisions based on general materials or, or uh, not general materials, um, structural relationships. Um, I, I've, that would have to be done at a closer level. Um, but this still gets us started. And that's all my assignment requires for this survey class is to get it started. And you can do the work on it in the future. Okay, think about the past from Genesis and Jesus love and obedience. So uh, past to present continuity of love and obedience principle, something like that. Um, Spiritually discerned doctrine, all right. Spiritually discerned doctrine and uh, spiritual fellowship, something like that. And then three, one to 24, which would be 11 to 24, three, 
Oh, that's software 11. That is 41 through 512. 41 through 512. And then 513 through 20. Um, proper pair, proper for enemies, for spiritual enemies. This this is for spiritual enemies. Or how about this, brothers acting like spiritual, or acting as. I guess because it's not a like issue, it's as they really are acting that way. Okay. So then we'll go to something lighter color. And based on the color and the vision, you can see the distinction. So my main point is the darkest stuff, the, the sub points for that first main point. And I probably need to make my colors uh, table properties. No, no, that's not what I want. Um, Border styles. Okay. Need to make that darker and wider. But we'll just work on that. Um, okay, so let's just review what I have so far. We have uh, we have a chart indicating our major and minor divisions and even some subdivisions of one of those uh, major division sections. So that'd be like segments, right? We have our main sentence and purpose of the book summary. And I want to preserve all of this. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and put it underneath the chart. What I don't have is I don't have the full outline yet. So I'm going to uh, make the rest of the outline. And so I'm gonna copy what I have. Well, I'm not gonna copy that far. I'm just gonna copy this much. I wonder if we're at two hours or three hours by now. <laughs> All right, so we already have that statement. Boom, one through four. So we'll go up here to one through four, and we're like, okay, what? So that's going to be a sub point of this. And I will remove the uh, highlighting later. Five through 10. Okay. All right. Um, two, one through four. See, that's not important right here. Um, two, one through six is what we want. Seven through fourteen. Fifteen through seventeen. Okay. Well, according to that, that's its own level. Interesting. All right. That's fine. Let me eighteen through twenty five. Oh, oh, sorry, I almost made a mistake. That's 17, not 27. And then 18 to 25, we go there. And then 26 to 27, we'll actually go there as well.
Don't need that. 28, 29. Sub one here. And we don't always include uh, every, every level. I mean, but I'm going down to the paragraph level. But the reason I'm doing that here is because I want to preserve my argument uh, so that my professor and others can see why I labeled it the way I did. Um, three through 10. Eighteen to twenty four. Four six. Seven twelve. Five thirteen twenty. Uh oh. All right, I got it. This is still all five. So five of these go up here. And you see, you can do them all at once. Um, I'm just not very good at it in that way. And then, so this will be And then I'm going to have to make a change in this. Um, let's do that. Make this 20. Shrinking it down. Let's make it all one color. And let's remove the outlines. So there you have it. There's our outline for the book, at least down to the paragraph level that's indicating our major and minor divisions. And so the benefit of that is that you see you see how um, you see information that I don't have included in here, like the, the paragraph level. I don't have that stuff included in here, but in the outline I do. Um, so I'm trying to think what else I got to do. The only other thing I have to do now is is uh, insert commentary from the source, the textbook that we're using. And um, let's see, where is it? Right here. Oh. So I'm just gonna copy all this into uh, our document.
I'm gonna pick a color. Um, I do have purple there, so I'm gonna make I'm gonna make the com uh, the commentary green. I can always change my colors later on. And I'll make it all bold so I can see it. Okay, so author, date, audience, purpose, theological emphasis, characteristics. All right, so let's look at the outline. So this particular outline uh, says, here, let me make it bigger. The purpose of the epistle. Okay, I, I can definitely see that. One through four, all right? They see the first section as one, five, two through nine, uh, light. Remember I talked about that, that there's a section, there's one argument that the book divides by light and love. So they're saying that light is the main motif here. God is light and conditions for living in the light. I'm totally with that. Um, living as children of God, that accounts for the repetition of the children of God even though you still see the little children and things like that mentioned here. Um, but the children of God, okay. God is father. Conditions for living is God's children. The conclusion, you got a big conclusion section here. Confidence in action, prayer, certainty of knowledge, assurance, and final warning, adultery. I do like that division better than mine, but... Um, you know, it's what I did. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to insert these as they relate to my work. So one, one to one, four is going to go underneath my commentary. And as I explained in other videos, when you're only dealing with your source and another source, the color coding thing works just fine. Um, if you're doing multiple sources, of course, you would have their footnote and all of that. But, well, I don't want it to be dead center. So one through four is my division. Okay, I have some things I got to take out. I'm not going to, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this and stick it to here then erase that. That's just some issues about pasting in from this particular document. Now this is one, one, one through four. I'm gonna put all this on the same level. But, uh, since my division was larger, I'm gonna go ahead and put it underneath here where I talk about that. Um, and I can condense that anymore. Okay, the John 2 stuff accidentally printed over, so I don't need that. So living in light, we'll just do one, five, and seven first. Living in light. When I said that, it sounded like I'm singing that song, Do a Little Dance. <laughs> but I uh, don't think that's the what's going on there. All right, so I'm going to put that underneath here. Conditions for living in the light. So he's got the contrast, the planes here. Um, it's a chart too, which means I'm gonna to have to modify that. I'll preserve it either way. But yeah, um, all I'm gonna do for the rest of this video is align this, this commentary underneath what I've said and then go through and read that commentary and, and uh, know some differences, you know, things like that. And, but I'm not going to, 
I've already done that in other videos. So I'm just going to end this video here. And uh, anyway, if uh, this is beneficial to you, um, then subscribe if you haven't already. Like it. In other words, hit the thumbs up. Hit the bell if you want notifications. Share this with others. But most of all, please keep this ministry in prayer. God bless.